Hi, I'm Chris. Welcome to my glass studio. I'm going to show you some of the tools and some of the equipment and some of the raw materials that I use to create my pieces. This is, initially, this is one of my glass storage cases. This is kind of how the glass comes. Here's one that I didn't have room for in there. Comes in these size sheets for the most part. I also purchase um, or may create vitrograph, which is um, glass that is pulled from the bottom of a molten kiln. And then you can um, use that to, in, to incorporate into your pieces. My first kiln has some items that are cooling off after their final firing. So they're ready to go. All of these pieces were first created flat in the first firing up to um, 1600 degrees and then I did some cold working with my grinders that you'll see later on and then they did a, a, a another firing to kind of finish them off and smooth out those edges then I took them to my sandblaster which is out in the garage because I was wanting a matte finish and if you look at this piece this glass it's got a matte finish on it this glass is made it's the very same glass but on this one, I did not sandblast it, so it has a shiny look, and this piece has the flat look. And I'm really enamored with the sandblasting right now. And it's fun to sandblast. Th those are some pieces that are ready to go now. Here I have my mold storage, and those are all the different shapes that I can create with glass, although I also do some things creating um, shapes that you can't get a mold for by building dams around them and um, creating exactly the shape I want, which makes them very individual. Even I could re recreate it exactly that way if I wanted to. This is another one of my kilns. Uh, there's nothing in it right now, but there will be soon. <laughs> and this is my little baby kiln that I initially started with, and after one month, I ordered the big one because <laughs> I already knew that I didn't have nearly enough um, space in there. And along this wall, what looks like jars of paint, all of that is glass. It's called frit. Some of it is in powders all the way up to chunky pieces of glass that I use um, in creating my pieces as well. My main work table is here with my um, big glass cutter. When I'm cutting the sheet glass, this is how I do that. Um, I have other pieces that I use over here. Sometimes I make part sheets. But these are all part sheets that then I cut up and place into other pieces to create a finished look, which makes them very individual. Um, and not just putting two pieces of glass together to fire it off. This is a piece of the vitrograph that we looked at the curly vitrograph earlier. This I pulled out twisted to get the patterns, well, pulling it out while it's molten, of course wearing heavy gloves and tools, and snipping it off and then you lay it on the, on the ground to let it cool and then you can chop it up and use it in other parts. one of my saws and it's always important safety safety when you're, when you're cutting glass and this is my big grinder in the back which I would use for um, this piece I left out here so you could see that it needs a little bit of cold working so to make those edges straight I would use that put it back in the kiln to fire again and um, so that so that it, it's as perfect as I can get it. Um, when I'm when I'm creating, what I do is audition different colors of glass when I have an idea in mind of what I want to make. And this piece has already been cut, but I'll show you a little bit how I did that. And in this piece, I've incorporated both um, strips of of glass, and I've also cut glass this very same piece on its side to give it a little different bit of a design element and fit that in there, but I'll, I'll give you a clue of how I cut that glass. And I'm going to make, and this glass, I probably shouldn't have chosen it because this glass in particular is a bit stiff, which means it can be wonkier to cut. And there's also a flaw 
right in the middle of this glass. I only use hand rolled glass and it is more difficult to cut than the machine rolled, but it's how glass was always, how it was originally made in the sheets, which makes it very cool to be. So I could either use this in a flat piece or I could cut thinner strips and set them on edge in different designs for the, and that would be really attractive. If I were going to use the powders, the powdered glass, I would need to mask up because you do not want to be breathing this. And then I would use sifters to create the pattern I wanted. I might draw on it. I might, um, sometimes I spray water on top, which makes it easier, just as if you're painting, you know, you're drawing in sand to make a pattern and then it would go into the kiln. It's very important to always clean your glass. So this used to be a bottle of Fit, but now it is glass cleaner. <laughs> we in recycling. Some of the tools I use, this is a handheld glass cutter. This, this is my large glass cutter. And this is called, these are called breaking pliers. And you line up right on the line where you've scored the glass and pop it open so that it makes a clean cut, usually. Every once in a while it doesn't. <laughs> It came to be when I turned 50, I loved my career, but I went on what I called my passion quest to see what else do you love. So the summer of my 50th year, I took exclusively art classes and nothing really, I mean I liked them all, they were all fun, um, but it wasn't until I took a bead making class that as soon as the glass rod hit the flame, I just felt like everything in my body said I'm home. And so for a while I just made beads and put them in mason jars or gave them away. I really didn't have any interest in making jewelry or anything like that. And then I took a mosaic class um, at Aramont College and we did a little bit of fusing and I never turned back. So I've been doing it now for um, 18 years. And there are always new techniques to try. During COVID, I, because all the shows are canceled, um, I have really felt free to explore um, things that, new techniques and things just to see what happens. I'm not, unfortunately, very good at making small samples of new things. I like to make big things, so I either have big successes or big failures. <laughs> this is an example of a sample sheet that I made um, with glass that is reactive, and, and by reactive I beat for instance, in this case, the base of this glass is French vanilla, which has selenium and sulfur in it. And on top is an Egyptian blue glass, which, which has copper in it. And when the copper and the sulfur selenium touch each other, it creates a reaction, which is the darkening lines around there. So I made several samples of reactive glass, which I love to work with. I love that look. So that when I wonder, um, what look am I going for now? I can refer to my chart to see, is this the look I want or is this the look I want? Or do I want none of those? And the small chart down here are colors of glass that I don't use real often. And um, they fire, the base of the glass unfired looks different than it does after it's fired. So I fired small samples so that I can be sure I'm getting the color that I want to use. Um, in the glass. Over here we have silver and gold leaf in the glass and I use that occasionally too which gives it a really kind of funky smoky look that I love. These are called stringers and they come in varied widths from um, two millimeters down to half a millimeter and I use them, I either use them straight in pieces or I curve them on one of my slumpy molds and I've got some curved ones over here that I can use um, if I want a curved line look and then I can break those up and incorporate those into pieces too and I really I really like the curved lines so I use these quite a bit like that. Um, I could show you some of the other glass that I use that is very expensive glass this is called dichroic glass, and it has metals in it. And I am like a magnet to the most expensive glass mm -hmm. that you can, you can buy. This came in, I've used some of it already. This 
little square was $20, but I even sometimes buy little squares that are $45. So that can kind of explain why a piece with Dicro in it can cost a lot more than uh, another piece. And you can either get clear back Dicro, which you can't see very well there, or black back Dicro, and this is an example of that, black on the back. And it has a very shiny, very in-your-face kind of a look which sometimes I like to do, and sometimes I don't. I have to be in the right mood to make jewelry, and I haven't been in that right mood for three years now, so all my jewelry is pretty old. I like to make big pieces, and I'm really interested in doing sculptural things now, which if you come over here, I can show you a couple of what I call the sculptural pieces. Um, using my saw, I cut the shapes that I wanted out of the glass and then um, put them flat in the kiln and dammed them so that they would stay touching each other and then refired it so that we would have space in there. This is another example in the background of a sculptural piece that I really liked. Some, of, some things are functional um, and some things, because of some of the chemicals that's in some of the glass, Bullseye Glass Company, where I buy all my glass from, says they're food safe, but personally, I would not. You can make them food safe by putting um, a coating of clear on all of them. And this is a new, new thing. I have large garden totems kind of behind us, and they sell really well, and I thought, well, I should use up my little scraps and make inexpensive little plant totems. Mm -hmm or steaks, so that's a, this is a new thing that I just played with this summer just for fun. And I should show you too, not everything that you do end up as you planned. Here's an example of something that, that bubble was not supposed to be there. And it was caused by either moisture or a bit of dirt underneath the glass, or I fired it too quickly and it didn't have time for the air to escape under there. But I keep it. So it's always good to remind yourself everything you do is not the way you <laughs> intended it to be. I, um, if you want a piece to go flat and even, most of the time I fire sometime, somewhere between 1480 and 1700 degrees. That's as hot as my kiln will go. And what that depends on of how hot I want it to be um, depends on the piece itself and whether I'm using a dam to incorporate it if I'm having glass, molten glass drop down from um, a piece that's poised above it to create a piece. I can show you this piece. Front of this is what I, what I did there and I used um, essentially, this isn't the one I used, but it is an example. The one I used was bigger, but it's essentially like a flower pot with holes in the bottom and I post it up high and I stick pieces of glass in here and then fire it very hot so they drip down onto a base piece of glass and create a design. And it's a design that I don't really have any control over. Once I put the things in there and, kiln, and close the kiln, it just is going to make the design that it makes. But So you're, you're careful about the colors you choose and what you think is going to be compatible. So that's, that's, a, that's a firing that goes very hot for a very long time. Then I'm doing a tack fuse which is in this piece. After I would fused this piece flat, I added these elements of the curved stringers and the frit and fired it again, not as hot and not quite as long so that these adhere but retain their texture. And then this went in for a slump fuse so that it would create that wavy look. There are weeks when I'm out here probably for 30, maybe even 40 hours in a week. And there are other weeks where I'm not out here much at all. And it, it just depends. Um, sometimes there are periods where I'm not feeling very creative and I have learned to respect those periods because usually it means something is brewing and then all of a sudden I'll get an inspiration or an idea and I'll come out here and I'll, I'll just work nonstop. I will just not eat, not drink any water, not remember to sit down, and, and just be in, enmeshed in creating something. So it, it varies.
this is my very tiny but but very functional sandblasting room. And sometimes, if I want to create that matte look, I will or get rid of every once in a while because the glass is hand rolled. Some of the glass has um, um, things in it that you don't you don't want to see. So I might sandblast those off. But I would put a piece in here and close it up. And I'm not going to turn on the air compressor because it would be very noisy. But then I can see through the window and I can use a nozzle and sandblast an item until I create that matte finish. And then I'm going to clean it off and take it back into uh, a slum piece. Um, because I'm 69 now, and it's very difficult to set up for shows and things. I only do um, a couple of local shows, the McDonough Art Festival, Clear Lake Art Festival, and then we have our North Iowa Studio Tour, but of course I don't have to move anything then. It's very difficult doing outdoor shows for me because wind is so prevalent and wind and glass are definitely not friends. So it, it can be really um, a stomach churning event to be outdoors at a show. And there just aren't very many area shows that are indoors. And the glass looks wonderful out in the sun, but the wind is a real issue. So those are some of the tools that I use um, in creating my glass.